because quite a few that call themselves Christian don't believe the Bible is a communication from God to man. They think, well, it's, you know, legends and traditions and stories and accumulated over the years and oral traditions that found their way into written form. And it's really just the accumulated, uh, the accumulated thoughts of man compiled together in a book. You know what a pathetic bibliology that is? We'll have more to say on that when we get to bibliology. Or even worse, even worse. I had a man tell me that uh, you know the Old Testament was just Jewish propaganda. They wrote it to justify how they could dominate the Arabs around them. They wrote it to justify how they could steal the land. They wrote it to justify, well, God gave us this land. And, and we're God's favorite children. And you guys are nothing. And they just... And, and it's, it's interesting, this person who told me all this uh, is, is vehemently anti-Semitic. He hates the Jews, and so he hates the Bible. Well, at least he hates the Old Testament. He has different reasons for hating the New Testament. Um, but you understand, this is the approach. And sadly, there are Christians that hold, that agree with what this man would say. There are pastors that agree with what this man would say. They don't hold to a biblical uh, revelation of the Bible. So that's why I'm thankful that Geyser takes the time to work his way through this in a very tedious fashion, but maybe tedious isn't the right word, in a very methodical fashion. And I find that uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, benefit from this uh, repeatedly in the years to come. And so he defined this whole paragraph that I just read then gets unfolded in the 12 chapters of the, of the uh, prolegomena, Right? This belief presupposes that many things are true, most of which are challenged by our current culture. So evangelicalism presupposes that there is a theistic God. I mean, it really makes no sense to attend a Bible church and study the Bible or to study theology and, and biblical theology or systematic theology. If you don't think there is a God, why are you studying the Bible? Okay, If God didn't write it, you know, what other reasons do you have? Are you just studying it as a moral treatise? Are you... Do you read it like you read Confucius or you read uh, you know Poor Richard's Almanac or you read whatever else you, you judge your life by I mean, what, why are you studying the Bible if you reject theistic uh, the, biblical theism okay. so evangelicalism presupposes there is a theistic God that's why we have the metaphysical precondition of chapter 2 we believe there is a God and even if we didn't have a Bible we would still believe there is a God there are reasons apart from the Bible to understand that there is a God. And it's not, it's not uh, unreasonable to believe that there's a God. Okay? And all we're doing is we're presenting the fact that it is reasonable. You can make a rational case for the existence of God apart from the Bible. You can make a rational case for the existence of God. For a number of different reasons, and that's what we'll talk about in chapter 2. Uh, so that's a precondition. Also, who created the world and can miraculously intervene in it? That's the supernatural precondition, which we'll get into in next week's reading, chapter 3. Do you believe, first of all, that there's a God? Okay. Secondly, do you believe that that God can do miracles? If so, again, you're in the minority of Christianity today. It has a very non-miraculous approach to the Bible, non-miraculous approach to God, non-miraculous approach to a lot of things. You know, he didn't really part the Red Sea. It was really kind of the Reed Sea. It was really kind of the wind blew in a certain way. And they've always got these, these ex scientific explanations for how maybe a miracle could have kind of sort of happened. And, and they don't believe any of the miracles actually happened. They just find a scientific reason why uh, a primitive early Bible times person might have been confused to think it was a miracle. And so he wrote it down in the book as if it was a miracle. And stupid him. But now we, of course, are smart. We have science. We know... Uh, we know so much better than they knew. Okay? And tragically, this is the approach. The non-miraculous approach. And they will find everything in the world to deny why there was six days of creation, or why, no, there wasn't a global flood, come on, it was just a local flood, or, or uh, any number of things. Any number of things that, and they name the name of Christ, they profess Christianity today, but they deny that miracles are possible. A God who has revealed himself in both general and special revelation. This is the revelational precondition. You actually believe that God wrote this book and he meant for us to, uh, to learn from it. And that it's in this book that we have things we would never learn otherwise. Things which I have not seen or ear heard or have entered into the heart of man. 
All the scientists in the history of the world, all the philosophers and all of their ponderings would never discover what is revealed for us in the scripture. They would never discover the plan of salvation and the redemption that's provided through faith in Christ. The, um, anyway, the rest of this statement just works your way through the, uh, the chapters of the Prolegomena and all of the preconditions and why preconditions are important. All right. And, and there's nothing wrong with preconditions. You, you, you approach anything with certain givens. <coughs> anything, any study you approach with certain givens. So, for example, the preconditions for two human beings communicating with each other. Well, what is that? If two human beings are going to communicate, well, what are the preconditions? Well, you assume, first of all, there's a mind capable of sending a message. There's a mind capable of receiving a message. And there's a common mode of communication, a language, a code, or something that's in common. Okay. If, uh, you know, if it's not in common, then the message can't be transmitted and received. The transmissions in the AM band and the receivers on the FM band, you're not going to have the message communicated. Uh, the, the receiver needs to be on the same band as the transmitter. Okay? Speaking the same language, using the same code. And this is, it seems simple, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem to make sense? Well, that's what the Bible is. God has revealed himself to us in a manner that we can understand. In a man, he chose human languages to do it. He didn't have to, but he did. And his choice to communicate and put it in writing in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek means that we can comprehend what it is he's revealed to us. The secret things of the Lord belong to him, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And he put it in writing and he used human languages to do it. And so those choices he made, they're preconditions. We understand that. All right. So we understand, and this is how we taught years ago, this is how we taught our hermeneutics. The fact that words communicate thoughts, right? And so the, the words of the Bible communicate the thoughts of God. And because he used human languages, we have to handle the Bible linguistically. But because it communicates thought, we have to handle the Bible logically, rationally. These are, there's laws that govern speech, there's laws that govern thought. And so these, these kind of, they're built in. They're built-in approaches to our hermeneutic, uh, uh, built-in approaches, preconditions, what guys are calling here, preconditions for how we start. And if we can't agree on this, then let's just walk away now. There's no point in moving forward. All right. So, I think without the preconditions of the prolegomena, there's, there's reason really not going to edify you to study the remainder of the systematic theology. You know, how, how would you be edified to study... Bibliology. How would you be edified to study ecclesiology? How would you be edified to study eschatology or any of the rest if you don't subscribe to the same preconditions that are described here in the Prologue? If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in His revelation, if you don't believe in His ability to to interact with the world on a miraculous basis. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on to chapter two? This was the easy chapter. I meant to be faster on this first chapter because we're going to run out of time on the second chapter. All right. Did you have anything that jumped out at you? Anything that you highlighted, underlined, crossed out, got mad at? Anything you didn't understand? Anything you hated? Anything you loved? Anything at all there in chapter one before we move on to chapter two? All right. I'll let this go tonight. But if you, you consist in this, then uh, starting next time, I may provoke some more questions. All right. Chapter 2, God, the metaphysical precondition. What is metaphysics? Do you know what metaphysics is? Significance of metaphysics. Um, here's your definition. The study of being or reality. Literally, meta, beyond, and beyond the physical. Beyond the physical. And it's common. It's how they're used today in, in, in uh, scientific fields. you got your physicists and you got your metaphysics. And uh, one is usually scornful of the other, <laughs> okay? Because, you know, you understand this. You understand that the secular scientists today, they, they deny the soul. They can't define the soul. They can't put it in a Petri dish. They can't examine it under a microscope. And if they can't empirically study it, it doesn't exist. 
And so they end up with this mind-body problem they try to solve in different ways, or they just don't even bother trying to solve it. They just simply leave it all as a physical phenomenon. You don't really have a mind. You just have electrons that fire in your brain. It's all physical, chemical. Okay? And so that's how they solve, in their minds, how they solve the, the mind-body problem. They tell you it's all physical. It's all physical, it's all chemical, it's all your brain. Okay? The idea of an immaterial part of you, a soul, a spirit, something that interfaces in a spiritual dimension with God, well, that's something else that doesn't exist. Okay? The spiritual dimension, God, any of that. If you're purely a physical reality person, then physics is your realm and metaphysics is a waste of time. All right, it's the study of being or reality. It's the study of being as being. I like the way he put that too, as opposed to studying being as physical. That's physics. If, if you think all being is physical, well, there's the realm of physics way. Or all being is mathematical. That's, the, that's mathematics. Okay? The being of, the mathematical being as it were. Metaphysics is often used interchangeably with ontology. You might want to write that down. Metaphysics is often used interchangeably with ontology. If you have a quiz question that say, oh, I don't know, hypothetically maybe says, uh, metaphysics uh, is often used interchangeably with blank, then you're going to want to put a word in that blank. And a word that you don't want to be graded against you might be a word like ontology. Okay. Being. And so, you know, it's interesting. Um, again, we talk about on an apologetic basis. I think a lot of um, apologetic ministries, and I don't want to be critical. I don't want to be critical of, of, um, of Ravi Zacharias or Wayne Lane Craig or anybody there's doing some remarkable things out there. Uh, but in some respects, our job gets easier when we limit our obedience to what we're commanded to obey. What do I mean by that? If you encounter somebody who says, I don't think there is a God. And if there is, I hate him anyway. Okay? Do you have a biblical mandate to argue with them, to debate with them? Definitely the opposite. Exactly the opposite, that's right. Now, again, different believers have different convictions. I'll tell you my conviction. Okay? My conviction, based upon Peter, is I am to give an account for any who ask for the hope that is within me. So if somebody comes to me and I determine... I get the sense, I understand that they actually are legitimately curious. They actually are asking for information. They, they, they want to know. All right? Then I'm all on it. I am, I am there. I am ready to give an account. And I'll talk to them as long as they want to talk. I'll give them answers. Okay? Uh, I will explain why I believe what I believe. I will explain anything they want to know. If they're true seeking. In other words... I, I, I determine, you know what? The Holy Spirit's convicting them. The Father's drawing them. They're, they're asking, you know, a year ago they wouldn't have asked these questions, but now they are. And they, they really want to know. And, and if they're weak, if they're struggling, if they have a hard time embracing it, I'm fine with that, as long as they're legitimately asking those questions. But if they're confrontational and destructive, if, they really, if they're asking questions only to criticize, if they don't really want to know, if they're making a point, their own point or whatever, then I don't believe that qualifies under First Peter. To ever be ready to make an account, uh, a defense. Okay, I think then the scripture that comes into play, as far as my conviction goes, is the the passage about pearls before swine. And in there, I'm commanded not to cast my pearls before swine or to give what is holy to the dogs. Okay, there, I believe in my conviction anyway. I can be discerning and say, you know what, <laughs> I'm not here to answer that. I'm not here to argue with you. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Okay? Now, again, I'm describing for you tonight my convictions of First Peter, my convictions of Matthew, my convictions of the Scripture, where I rightly divide between always being ready to give an answer and not giving an answer. Okay? Uh, it's like Proverbs, where it says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. And then the very next verse says, answer a fool according to the... Right? you got back-to-back -back verses there. Okay? 
And so, well, which is it? The answer is it's both, depending. Okay? And if you're discerning, and if you're praying, you humble before the Lord and ask, you know, Lord, is this a do not reply circumstance, or is it a reply circumstance? What would you have for me to do? To speak or to be silent? There's a time for both. 